This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. were on Minneapolis this week. What lessons, if, if any, has Canadian policing learned from the Floyd tragedy and the Derek Chauvin verdict? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mona. And uh, for some the viewers of, of yours that are celebrating uh, Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak to all, um, and uh, uh, a healthy um, period for everybody, regardless of religious background. The, the George Floyd murder, um, the resulting demonstrations, uh, the ongoing prosecution, because although the guilty plea is in, there are still portions of the court case that will have to continue on. Um, it reminded me of other tragedies that I've seen in the course of my life, of my, my time here in Canada, and my time as a police officer, going back to incidents like Rodney King, uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, where we've seen um, a lot of hopes and aspirations for a justice system that, uh, and a policing institution uh, that have often failed communities and most often communities that are marginalized um, and, and often racialized. And in this case, particularly the black community. Um, I, I can't tell you how profoundly devastating it was to watch the video. I still to this day have not personally finished watching the entire video. Um, I just can't, my humanity doesn't allow it. My professionalism though requires me to as you asked, learn something about it as a human, as a professional, and as a police chief uh, for the Ottawa Police Service. Um, there's a wide range of lessons that must be learned from this, but this is a symptom of the larger changes that must happen in the policing institution and the broader criminal justice. The first thing is this tragedy should never have occurred. There shouldn't be a member of any police service who could uh, think and act in such a way that's a condemnation of the individual, in this case, the former police officer, Derek Chauvin. But it is also a condemnation and repudiation of the larger policing system, how, how it recruits people, how it manages those people, uh, how it assesses the risks of those people, um, to what extent it can remove such people from the organization prior to them committing such tragic and criminal acts. Uh, so this is not, in, in this case, about one individual and one bad apple. It's a requirement to review the entire system. Um, how do people come into the organization? How do they um, provide valuable services while in the organization? And if they're incapable of doing that, how to remove them from the organization so they don't cause other harm? So it goes well beyond the individual. It speaks to the system, the structure, the culture, the legislation, the oversight. Um, there's obviously a clear issue around over-policing and underserving. Did we really get to any sort of achievable justice outcome or public safety outcome in this George Floyd incident, which was really triggered over a, a potential $20 fraud? Could any um, tragedy of this scale be, be, be referenced to a $20 uh, potential level? Um, and so I think we need to redefine what public safety actually means. And I like what we're doing here in Ontario, where we've moved away from the definition of public safety and broadened it to be community safety and well-being. So it still includes whether or not there needs to be a criminal justice intervention, but it, can, it includes a lot more. Is there somebody suffering from mental health and addictions? Is there a social services issue like poverty or homelessness that we can address here? And if we can look at that broader definition, we might actually prevent the, the call to the police from happening in the first instance, where rather than looking to create a criminal response to this $20 issue, there's a social service response that potentially precludes the police from ever being called to something like this in the future. Um, and then we get right down to the, the, the grassroots level. Do our officers actually have the right skills and training uh, to not escalate a situation, but de-escalate a situation? And is that training being designed by the police alone or should it be designed by the community and academics? Should it be delivered by the police alone or should it be delivered by uh, uh, trained and certified educators and teachers with a pedagogical understanding around how training can affect thinking and behaviors and actually meaningful outcomes. So those are just some of the thoughts I have. It's not an exhaustive list, but clearly as much progress as we've been making, so much more needs to be done. And that tragedy needs to have an immediate and long-term impact, positive impact on policing, 
the justice system and society, not just in the United States, here in Canada and around the world. So my second question was related to my first, and you kind of uh, answered it, but if you wanted to add anything, as a police chief, how do you make sense of the seemingly, like seemingly bottomless well of police shooting, brutality, and fatal interaction with people of color specifically? Uh, well, thank you uh, again for the question, Mona. Um, uh, I, I understand why you use the term seemingly bottomless well. I think that's part of the problem. Um, while in Canada, we keep a, a lot better statistics on police use of force, particularly shootings and deadly encounters. In the United States, they do not have anywhere near the same level of accountability and data to inform the level of risk associated with these things. Let me be clear. Any fatal encounter between police and community is one too many. Any encounter where the, uh, a member of the community, for whatever circumstance, is left injured, seriously injured, or killed is one too many. The goal should be do no harm, zero incidents. I know from a practical standpoint, I'm aspirational and I'm practical. Aspirationally, I'd like to believe we could reach a point in society where there was no injuries or deaths associated to an encounter between police and community, and we should work towards that aspirationally. Practically, we need to do everything we can to reduce those incidents, and when they happen, to reduce the trauma directly and indirectly associated to them. Um, so data is a very important aspect. How many of these things are happening? In what frequency? What trends? What geographies? What other elements? Demographic elements? And obviously race being a critical demographic element. I see here in, on, in Ontario now, the Ontario government is moving towards using demographic and race-based information to assess a wide range of outcomes from public health, to public education, and yes, to policing. In Ontario, we now, within our use of force reporting, do have to report on demographic and race-based information so that it can be assessed at the macro level and addressed at the local level. So we're seeing steps going in the right direction there, but we need to do a lot more of that in terms of using demographic and race-based information as part of, an important part of, assessing the overall effectiveness of policing and the justice system. So uh, there's a fundamental public distrust of police we are seeing within the U.S. and Canada. So given that level of cynicism, is it possible for police to rebuild trust within without external oversight? It's a great question. I, I, I want to answer it very specifically. But, but again, let me just, I've been studying the issue of public trust going back over two decades now. Um, and I, I was first introduced to a study out of the United Kingdom. Uh, that looked at the levels of public trust through the late 90s and the early 2000s. And what they found specifically was that trust across the board in policing and all institutions was falling off from the mid 90s. Specifically, it then uh, broke it down from general trust to trust with new immigrants, refugees, uh, indigenous racialized community members. And the level of trust was even lower than the general community. I'm pretty sure any research around the issue of public trust in society, in society's institutions, in the criminal justice sector, as well as in the policing institution will show that trend line has continued and incidents like the George Floyd murder would have further driven trust down. I guess my message out of that is in general, people are trusting everything less. They trust their politicians less, their judges, their doctors, their teachers, and yes, they trust their police officers less. In policing, as much or more so than any other institution, the public's trust is actually mission critical to us being able to do a good job. So while, while I can comment generally on the state of trust in society, specifically, there is no way that any police service can be effective, truly effective, unless it, unless it has the trust and confidence and consent of the local population in which it provides those police services. So it's an easy answer for me. We must do everything we can to rebuild trust. The tougher part is how do you change a trend that's not just a year in the making since George Floyd, it's actually over two decades in the making for a whole bunch of reasons. Some of them specific to what the police do or don't do. A lot of it even well beyond what the police do or don't do. The advent of social media is an example. It wasn't created by police. We don't particularly use it a lot, but it's one of the areas where disinformation, misinformation, and viral information has contributed to a significant erosion of trust in the general public in all of its institutions and its trust in the police. I'm not saying we ban social media, but I just want people to realize that the impact of trust is beyond just the police 
and the police ability to, to rebuild trust is beyond just the police. And we, it's first and most important on us to do everything we can, but we're going to require a lot more stakeholders and a lot more people, including the media, to help to create conversations like this where we can have a, a better discussion about what's taking place, eliminate the disinformation and misinformation, and focus on the few potential solutions that are available to us. Uh, thank you for that. So at Parliamentary Committee last July, you unequivocally stated that individual and systemic racism exists in Canadian policing and other institutions. So not all rank and file officers like to hear that message. So my question to you, is Canadians' trust and confidence in police at an all-time low right now? Uh, well, you're, you're going to have to ask somebody who can do large-scale surveys on, uh, to, on the last part of your question. Um, my my without the science and the data behind it yes i do believe this is one of the most um difficult complex and vexing times in policing history if not the most and at the heart of the reason why it is so difficult is the significant erosion of trust because of events like george floyd because of local events here in the city um and and the other reasons i gave in my previous answer um the challenge for any person and i believe any leader in, in public sector particularly for police chiefs is not to give in to that sense of, well, it's so low, we can't do anything about it. We have to do something about it. There, there's no easy way to, re, to, to rebuild trust or to build trust. It takes time. It takes two parties. Um, the effort can't, the effort must start on one side, but there must be some level of reciprocity and, and openness on the other side, no matter how difficult it is whether it's a fight between two, two marriage partners, between parents and their children, at some point, someone must make the effort and someone must be able to, at another point, reciprocate that effort. So uh, it's my intention, it has been my action since I arrived here in Ottawa to uh, build trust, even despite the challenges of COVID, which have ex has exposed systemic racism and systemic uh, inequities across the entire system and society and in, in the, the fallout from the George Floyd murder, which has shown a clear spotlight on the, if, on the issue of trust in policing, I still have a responsibility, an oath of office, and a personal desire to build and rebuild trust with all community members, but specifically those who've been most impacted, our marginalized and racialized and Indigenous and Inuit communities. And do you think that the chiefs and the rank and file truly understand the danger to themselves in this climate where police actions are undermining their legitimacy and their safety? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I realize I didn't fully answer your previous question. Um, I I'll guarantee you, if you invited 100 people in or even 10 people into a conversation and said, what's your definition of racism? What's your definition of systemic racism? What's your definition of bias? Implicit bias, explicit bias. These are relatively new terms to most Canadians. And they're relatively new terms to most police officers. So I understand when I use a term in my presentation as I did to the Prime Minister and the Standing Committee, that systemic racism exists in policing as it does across all of Canadian society, that a lot of people, both police officers and common everyday citizens would go, what the hell did the chief just say? What does that mean? Is he calling me a racist? Well, no, systemic racism is related to individual acts, but not just about individual acts. It means, we have unintended outcomes from policies, practices, and procedures that advance some demographics and disadvantage others. Whether you're a woman, you're Muslim, you're Indigenous, you're Black, you're, you're a person with a disability, but if you have a system, a policy, a procedure that advantages some disadvantages, you have, by definition, a systemic discrimination. When it comes to systemic racism, we can see the outcome more so than we can see the intent. The outcome is we have disproportionately more people of color who are in our criminal justice system and in jail or injured by police officers and the system itself. So that's what I mean. I am not saying that every single officer is a racist. What I am saying is every single member of this organization, including me, has a bias. We're human beings. We have to deal with our human biases. We have to be professional enough. We need the skills and tools and supports and systems to recognize that a human organization will have human outcomes from our individual and collective biases, from the systems that are not sophisticated enough or mature enough to prevent them and manage them going forward. So that's what I mean. And I think it's incumbent on every organization, whether private sector or public sector, 
whether it's the police or social services or public education, public health, it's incumbent on the leadership and the membership of those organizations to do everything they can to individually manage their weaknesses and systemically manage those organizational weaknesses as well. So uh, going to the next question, in your statement at committee, you said uh, to, to dismantle systemic racism along with all forms of discrimination in policing, we need to make positive investments in police culture. So what form does this investment take? Well, some of it is just having those very difficult conversations with your membership. So after I had made those statements around systemic racism, we had a heck of a lot of really difficult conversations, some of it with great agreement and enthusiasm and a lot of it with, well, what did you mean? I don't understand and I feel very disrespected and I'm not sure where I, where I, you know, what direction I'm supposed to go. And, and some of it just, you know, we're gonna have to agree to disagree. I'll never convince you, you will never convince me, but I have a responsibility to move this organization forward. I will say the trajectory over the last six months, uh, eight months, nine months now, it has been, we have more people understanding the terminology. Therefore, they're more intellectually able to invoke their emotions into self-reflection and organizational reflection. And we're seeing a greater critical mass of people within the organization, leaders within the organization, who are embracing, understanding the need for change and embracing the need for change individually and organizationally. We've come a long way, but we're nowhere where we need to. And again, the events of the last year with COVID, the events of post George Floyd and the events of the last 48 hours since the decision came down have stimulated further conversation and further evolution of our culture and our organization and our individual members. And is there any kind of training being carried out like in this regard, for example, de-escalation training or like anything like that? Yeah, so um, uh, you, you may recall that in the 2021 budget process, we specifically put aside resources to uh, 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 rebuild, re redo, reevaluate our de-escalation training and expand it. Um, we're actually going to uh, partner with a local university who will come in and do an external evaluation on what's called the efficacy of that training. Is it actually working? Is it making a positive difference? We're going to expand that review to assess all of our training in the organization. We've gone beyond training, though, because I will tell you, Mona, that training in itself has proven to be the least effective way to change somebody's thinking and behavior and feelings. You go to a classroom for eight hours, you learn a formula or you learn a new technique, retention of that knowledge falls off to almost 5% uh, of retention. So development, intercultural development, cultural competency development are things that have proven to be far more effective to change thinking and behavior at, at the individual level. But even then, I could be a highly functional, culturally competent, very knowledgeable individual, but I work in a system that doesn't value and support equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we got to move from training to development and from development to an EDI system where structurally, culturally, systemically, we promote and advance and enable equity, diversity, and inclusion. Those are the three keys to really addressing systemic racism or any form of systemic discrim discrimination. Uh, so it's a good thing you brought uh, you brought up culture because I was uh, going to move on to policing and culture in my um, uh, next set of questions. So new immigrants come to Canada and many have come from places where there is no trust in police, uh, like only fear from police. So w do you have any comments or like any sensitive about that? Yeah, um, I'm an immigrant to this country too. I, I came from uh, Jamaica when I was just shy of my 10th birthday. And one of the major reasons my parents decided to move, they loved, uh, they loved their country, they wanted to raise their kids there. And uh, we left friends, we left family. And, and you know, my, my immigrant story is, is the same as tens of millions of other immigrant stories. We love Canada, we're grateful for allowing us to come and allowing a person like myself to, to grow up and, and to have such a successful life here. Um, I'll be forever grateful to Canada, but you know, I asked my mother to this day, she wished she could have kept us there. One of the reasons we left was that we, the state of lawlessness at that point in the mid-1970s and the, in, the inability of the police and the justice system to address that lawlessness, and in some cases contributing to it through corrupt practice, through excessive use of force, through deadly use of force, uh, is one of the main reasons that hundreds of thousands of Jamaicans left and traveled to the United States, to Canada, and the UK. So I have a deep understanding, and personal compassion, and empathy to that story. But I've also been on record and said 
that the brand of policing here in Canada is the best in the world. That doesn't mean that there are clear examples of bad policing, bad apples in policing, bad systems in policing, bad outcomes in policing. But from a standard, a global standard, Canada's policing and justice system is at the top. Canadians need to have confidence in that system. Even though we're losing trust, even though we have glaring examples of the failures, we need to have confidence in that system. It underpins our democracy. It's why we came from India, from Jamaica, from South America to this country. As soon as we lose faith in the entire democracy and its main institutions, well, I guess what's our option? So again, I implore people, believe that we're trying to make it better and there is progress being made despite the setbacks and believe enough that you will come to the table and contribute to making it better. Bring your ideas, bring your complaints, bring your context, bring your lived experience and help us to make it better. The alternative is an even worse state of affairs than what we're facing right now. So, but don't you think there's danger in them carrying over this fear, especially when they see incidents or like racist videos of officers talking about the end of white policing? Well, I, I can't deny that reality, Mona, but I, I come back to it again. Yes, we can all feel revulsion. We can feel frustration. We can express that. But if that then becomes, well, I can't and won't do anything to make it better, and increasingly large numbers of people disengage, um, I don't know what the options are. Um, I'm not aware of a Western democracy that, that cancels an institution, whether it's the failures of public health to address uh, the, dis the disproportionate impacts on black and racialized communities. Uh, are we going to cancel the public health institution? Uh, the failures of public education to advance the education attainment uh, graduation rates of black, indigenous, and uh, immigrant communities, do we cancel the public education system and disengage from it, pull our kids out of the schools, or do we try to make it better? The failure of the private institution to make sure that the boards and executive towers are reflective of the people that walk on the streets, do we then disinvest in the private sector and take our money and put it where? So I come back to it again. It's human to feel frustration, devastation, um, to have aspirations and ambitions but it's re a requirement of a democracy to engage, not disengage. Even if we disengage for a short time, again, I understand the psychology of it. I myself have gone through that process for different reasons at different times in my 55 years. But at some point, you have to come back to the table to make the table better. Perfect. So uh, before I ask my last question, uh, I know you've talked that about, a lot about like your, uh, your perspective on developing uh, the, the system. Uh, and we can all understand deeply rooted historical challenges do not improve overnight, but what is your perception on, on, on your progress in Ottawa and of Canadian policing as a whole? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, I applied for this job in the summer of 2019. And I, I, I've said this to my board chair and I've said it internally, I'm not, not afraid to say it publicly. The job I applied for is not the job I have right now. I think every single organization and every single individual in Canada was changed when that pandemic came in. It has devastated the economy, it's devastated the healthcare sector, it's devastated our ability just to leave a, lead a normal life. It's why we're not doing this, this interview in person and, and in the normal fashion that we would. So whether you're a police chief or you're the prime minister, you're the premier, you're the owner of a small, medium, medium-sized organization, or you're just a parent at home with your kids, your job changed. My job changed in March of last year. Add on to that the, the global impact of the event uh, of George Floyd and the local impacts, like the Abdi Abdi Rahman uh, trial outcome. Uh, the job has changed. The focus, which before was modernizing a police service, quite frankly, is now around addressing the culture of this organization, addressing the public trust deficit we've been talking about, and building resilience um, and, and intercultural competence, inclusiveness into my individual officers and, and getting back in touch with the community and getting partners to the table to help us in all of that work. So um, it's a different job than I applied for, but it's still one that I'm committed to. I'm gonna stay here in Ottawa. I'm committing myself personally, professionally. My family's committed to this. My organizational leadership is committed to this. We're gonna get this done. You're right, it's not gonna get done overnight. It's not gonna get done fast enough for what people want and expect, but it's getting done. We're making progress and we're looking for the community's help to, to help us to accelerate that progress even further. 
So my last question is regarding uh, Ontario. We recently saw many statements from Ontario Police Services stating they wouldn't be using the enhanced powers granted by Doug Ford during the pandemic, which was met with a great deal of public skepticism, of course. Are you concerned that we've uh, we've very quickly reached a point where people believe that police lied to them? And how did you carry out those enhanced powers and how did they intersect with health policies? Well, let's just be very, very clear. First of all, um, the announcements that came out on Friday from the province were significantly retracted in the last in the in the next 24 hours, in part because most police chiefs, myself included, said we didn't think we needed those powers. Um, and some of those powers, the way they were expressed by certain elements within the government, were expressed in a very concerning way. So we were explicit to address those concerns here in Ottawa and said that we would not be randomly stopping anybody. Random stopping, whether it's an enhanced COVID power or, or any other thing, would be illegal against the Charter of Rights and against our values of an or, as an organization. So we were very explicit, regardless of whatever the powers are that we're going to be granted or have been granted, we're not randomly stopping people. The rest of the powers are still there. But what, what we've done here in, in Ottawa and what I think the best jurisdictions have done is, okay, thank you for these extended powers, but let's sit down with the Ottawa Public Health and our partners and decide what we need to do to address our local health outcomes. So we've been working with Dr. Etches, Ottawa Public Health, City Bylaw, and other partners to really assess what's going on here in Ottawa. And we do not see the need to utilize any of the additional powers that have been granted because we're addressing the public health outcomes here using other avenues, education, engagement, previous powers that came in a year ago. So again, hopefully that answers the, the, the question. For me, it's not what powers are granted, but to what extent any of those powers make any sense around achieving public health outcomes. I have more than enough powers from the Police Services Act, and I have more than enough powers from the previous uh, developments that took place over the last year. And based on the assessment from Dr. Etches and our Ottawa Public Health, we didn't see the need to expand that any further. Even with the border powers uh, to, to, to do the interprovincial border closings between Manitoba and Quebec, we started out looking at what we could do to address that. We worked with our auto public health folks. We reviewed it every day, and we found we didn't need to maintain it on a 24-7 basis. So we significantly scaled it back where we're now getting the best health outcomes with the least amount of disruption for the average person in Ottawa, Gatineau, Quebec, and Ontario. And that's my commitment to customize our efforts to achieve the best health outcomes, working in support of and under the overall guidance of Ottawa Public Health and Dr. Vera Etches. Thank you for, so much for that. So uh, that was my last question and I, I really appreciate your time. Um, if, if you have anything else you would like to add, uh, you're welcome. Well, again, Mona, thank you for the time asking such excellent questions. I really appreciate your audience interest in policing and the Ottawa Police Service. Um, and again, I, I, you know, we're, commit, we're committed to working with all members of the community here in Ottawa. Uh, we want to specifically build our outreach and rebuild our trust with uh, racialized communities, marginalized communities, new immigrant communities, uh, particularly those that have the most need for policing and have the most frustrations around the policing that they receive. What we're looking for is partners to work with us, and I'm hoping that your listenership will consider everything I've said and consider coming to help us to make this a better police service, a safer and healthier city, and a better society in, in, in general. Call the Rogers TV Viewer Response Line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Now you can enjoy the Amazon Prime Video app on Ignite TV. Just say Amazon Prime Video into your Ignite voice remote and watch Amazon originals like The Expanse. They wanted to fight. We'll give them one. The Wilds. Are we in the actual Bermuda Triangle? And The Boys. That is amazing. Prime members can stream Amazon originals, movies, TV shows, and more on Ignite TV today. Now you're in command.